The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, big suns and deep gravity wells lead to extreme reactionary drives in planetary offspring. Contention abounds. Sorceress Wit and Wisdom Plus. A special story returns like Haley's Comet for your listening pleasure. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. We have an interview with Grand Master of Science Fiction and multiple award winner Lois McMaster Bujol this time. Lois talks about her most excellent fantasy compilation. It's out now. That book is called Penrick's Progress. And the great Lois Bujold will tell us all about it. Now here's the news. The February new hardcovers and trade paperbacks have arrived, or will next Tuesday. Why are books released on the first Tuesday of the month? It's an ancient publishing tradition that has to do with the intros of oxen and sun cycles and stuff like that, so just trust us. It's an article of faith. Anyway, great stuff hitting booksellers everywhere. First up is Breaking Silence by Mercedes Lackey and Cody Martin. Fight for the Soul of Silence. Silence, Maine, was once a town left behind by progress, full of dread and misery, because the Blackthorns, the first family of Silence, who also happened to be Dark Elves, fed off the town's misery and liked it that way. But all that's changed thanks to teenage Stacy and her friends. The Blackthorns have been all but defeated. Industry is returning to town, and Stacy's mom, once a hopeless alcoholic, is improving. But evil dies hard, and Stacy. Now a mage in training senses that the Blackthorns have not yet given up the fight. Oh no, the soul of silence is on the line, and it is up to Stacy and her friends to push back against the encroaching darkness. A new entry in the heralded Serrated Edge series, also new in February, is The Initiate by James L. Cambius. A secret order of sorcerers rules the world. One man has vowed to destroy them. If people who can work magic are so powerful, why don't they rule the world? Well, as it happens, they do. One man wants to change that. The Apkalu are masters of magic. They rule the world from the shadows using mind control and deadly monsters to eliminate any threat to their power. Samakero lost his family to a demon sent by the Apkalu. He knows that nobody would believe the truth, but now an old man offers Sam the chance to find out who is responsible and bring down the Apkalu forever. And finally, new in February, is Straight Outta Dodge City, edited by David Boop. Ghost riders in the sky and on the prairies and plains. It's the final showdown between heroes and darkness in the Old West. Humans versus monsters, supernatural beings versus greater evils, with a dinosaur or two thrown in for fun. Come explore the untold myths of the West. A passel of great tales by Joe R. Lansdale, Mercedes Lackey, Jonathan Mayberry, James A. Moore, Harry Turtledove, Tex Thompson, and more. Straight out of Dodge City, edited by David Boop. The Initiate by James L. Cambius. Unbreaking Silence by Mercedes Lackey and Cody Martin are now available at booksellers everywhere. I want to welcome Lois McMaster Bujold to the podcast once again. Hello, Lois. Hi, Tony. A science fiction legend, Lois McMaster Bujold, has won six Hugos and three Nebula Awards. Um, her Miles Vorkosikan saga is a massively popular science fiction mainstay. Her many New York Times bestsellers include previous series entries, Cryoburn, Diplomatic Immunity, Captain Vort Patrol's Alliance, um, uh, what was the last one? Uh, Gentleman Joel and the Wet Red Queen was the last Vorkosigan book, I think. Yep. Uh, the Mother of Two. Uh, Lois lives in Minneapolis. And just recently, she was named uh, the uh, Damon Knight Grand Master uh, of Science Fiction that the uh, that Sefwa gives out. Um, yeah, that's pretty exciting. 
exciting, or is going to be pretty exciting. It's going to be, yeah. yeah. Um, very cool, very cool. Um, that is uh, that is probably the most meaningful thing Sefwa does. I <laughs> <So. laughs> do a lot of things. A lot of things with the, uh, but you know, most of the important stuff is not surrounding the awards. You know, the writer support. Kind of yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah. Well. Out now at booksellers everywhere is um, and doing quite well on the uh, on the bestseller list at the moment is um, Penrick's Progress by Lois McMaster Bujold, which is um, it's a collection of three novels uh, novellas maybe you would call them um, that are about this guy named uh, Lord Penrick Ger- Gerald I believe is his last name Lord Penrick Ken Gerald yep. Gerald and um, Maybe it's fantasy. Um, it's got a really cool world. Maybe tell us a little bit about um, how you came to write them and why we're just uh, gathering them together and putting them putting them out now. We're going to have um, another volume of this coming out later in the spring. So we have six. Is it six novellas? Yeah, there will be six. Yeah. Uh- both covers are great. Don Dos Santos did a wonderful job on the covers, and the design is, is lovely, so I'm really pleased with those. Yeah, to uh, to explain the context of the thing, I sort of have to jump into the Wayback Machine back to the turn of the millennium uh, when I wrote The Curse of Chalian as a fantasy novel, uh, followed by Paladin of Souls and The Hallowed Hunt, which were all published by HarperCollins. And that was a very interesting world. We'd come to call it the world of the five gods eventually and my original plan was that there should be five books one thematically for each of the five gods rather than a, uh, a kind of normal uh, chronological succession of events that is expected from a fantasy series uh, it's confused the readers because the first two really the second one really was a sequel to the first more or less it went off in a somewhat different direction with a different protagonist um, and then the third one jumped back two, three hundred years in time to a different country, different set of protagonists, different god, uh, and everybody who went charging into it thinking it was going to be a continuation uh, were rather taken aback. But anyway, those three went well, and um, but the other two, I just wasn't as interested in the other two gods, and then I got off to writing the Sharing Knife Tetralogy, which took several years. And then I got back to Bain and did some more uh, Miles for Cosigan stories. And uh, then I had finished Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen, finally. It had taken a long time to get through. Uh, in whatever year that was, 16, 15, 17, 2017, 16, I think. What year was that published? It, Wait. Well, I think it's uh, 17, so you probably were writing it in 15 and 16. 16, yeah. And I wanted to do something different, and I wanted to do something short. Uh, I was interested in sorcerers and wizardry and, and so on. You know, I thought it would be really fun to write a story about a really powerful sorcerer of some kind in some world. Um, and I started thinking about the um, the world of the Five Gods, uh, or the Chalian series. Uh, magic is not hugely central in that, although what has been dubbed speculative theology was. And I wanted to revisit that. I just said, yeah, put put him in this world and see what we can do with this interestingly constrained kinds of magic that they have there that I, that I only got to touch on previously. Uh, so I got to thinking about my character, and my first thoughts about him were hmm, sort of an older Penrick, you know, more developed character. And where should I begin with this? How should I start? And I decided to go back to his beginning, um, do his origin story first, rather than, you know, five volumes in and then do the angsty backstory. Um, and it helped me to, to think about, you know, who he is. It helped, to, helped me to develop him as a character. So I basically went back to Penrick Kinjerald, age 19, and the day he first acquired his demon and his magic. Uh, Because in this world, magic is not born innately. You acquire it uh, either through acquiring a chaos demon, which is an element of the fifth god, the the white god, also known as the bastard in the holy family, the father, the mother, the son, the daughter, and the bastard. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, which is a lot of fun. And he is, he is, he or she actually, it could be, is the god of uh, chaos, the god of luck, both good and bad, uh, the god of disasters out of seasons. The other gods all have their seasons, you know, spring, summer, winter, and fall. And the bastard is kind of the god of leap your day and, and those days that you really don't want to think about. <laughs> don't want to remember that day. Um, so he's, he's a lot of fun. Um, it's a trickster, yeah, trickster god, trickster figures are always popular in, in mythologies. Uh, at any rate, uh, I'm, I'm wandering astray from Penrick. Um, so it, it became how he acquired the first story, Penrick's Demon, uh, became how he acquired uh, the demon that, that turned him into a sorcerer, and then he had to scramble and learn how, because normally temple sorcerers are trained first and then given their demon. So typical for the bastard, everything's out of order and, and chaotic. But, uh, but that was a lot of fun. The, the several things I wanted to do with this story at that time, uh, besides write about the sorcerer, I wanted to write something short, a novella length. Uh, I've done some novellas before and enjoyed the length. They are long enough to do considerable character development, but short enough that you don't get mired in the middle for years, <laughs> potentially. <laughs> the block, yeah, you know, it still has its writer's blocks, but they're like mini blocks, and you get over them much quicker. Um so that was fun. I also wanted to try, um, because I had been doing e-publication with some of my backlist, I wanted to see what would happen if I put an original book out uh, as a direct e-publication, which many, many people have been experimenting with. Uh, so that was the other thing. that This was contractually free, and I could do that with it because of its length. Uh -huh. uh, so I wrote the story and put it up, and it did just fine. And then I thought of another one and continued. Almost from the beginning, people started asking, when am I going to be able to get this on paper? It's only available as an e-book. Well, I don't know. It was supposed to be an e-book. It was supposed to be like a la carte. Uh, but uh, then Subterranean Press picked them up as uh, um, sort of deluxe hardcover chapbooks, which, which were lovely additions, but once again, kind of expensive and not what people were looking for when they wanted, you know, a cheap paperback, which still didn't exist yet. Um, <laughs> well, it will eventually. <laughs> if we, eventually, if yeah. we have anything to do with it, we're, we're going to... The hardcover you guys just put it out, it's really pretty. It is, isn't it? Uh, but yeah, so, you know... So this is the... Sort of, the first time it's in it's, it's in big time print where it's going to be in all the bookstores. Yeah, yeah. Subterranean is a very interesting publisher for all scale and quirky projects, which this was. Uh, you know, a, a novella is not something a big publisher can put out you know, and expect to make a profit on at the kind of scales they work with. But Subterranean Press is small. Their business model, you know, is very restricted. Uh, they don't put books in bookstores, so they don't have to deal with the return system. Uh, in return, they get you know small print runs, uh, small total sales. That's a trade-off. Yeah. But their model is working. They've been in business for ages. Yeah, sure. It's been a delight to work with. Yeah, know. and we've we've done other uh, things with with Subterranean as well. Mm -hmm. But um, they're a good company. But once again, it was not you know it wasn't the thing, and then. Uh, because they do limited editions and only a single printing, when Penrick's Demon, the first book, went out of print and out of publication, that was it. You couldn't find it except used copies on the Internet, which promptly got bid up to insane prices, you know, a couple hundred bucks <laughs> for this thing. <laughs> wow. Um, so, you know, it was apparent that, you know, book one needed to be available, uh, you know, or story one needed to be available uh, in, a, uh, in a more accessible edition. Yeah, so and and it is it, it is beautiful. Dos Santos did a great job once again on a, on a cover. Um, so we'll talk about you. You mentioned the magic. Um, maybe talk about the world a little bit. So the demon, eventually, our our demon that that uh, Penrick acquires. Uh, her name is Desdemona. Um, eventually, yeah, he names her Desdemona. Yeah, he names her so he can uh, maybe. Uh, it's like a piece of the god, and it, but it fears the god because it can get reabsorbed. Or, or explain how the magic works a little uh, how bit. How the magic works? How this 
kind of magic. There's more than one kind of magic in this world. There's also shamanic magic, which is another system that's gone into it, the hollow taunt. But um, for this particular story, for the beginning story, demons originally appear in the world as little blobs of undifferentiated chaos. So you know, every demon blob that appears, uh, you know, invisible, um, it has potential powers, but no form because they come out of chaos. They have no form, no memory, no personality, no nothing. And they cannot exist in the world of matter without parasitizing some being of matter. You know, either, uh, usually, you know, when they pop into existence, uh, they will go into an animal because that's what's accessible. Uh, and then the animal dies, and then whenever the animal dies, they have to jump to you know, some other creature in order to stay alive in the world. Uh, so, you know, in order for these minds to exist, they must have bodies just just like us. Um, so, uh, so demons sort of work their way up, uh, and they acquire uh, form and thought and personality uh, by absorption or uh, copying uh, from whatever or whoever they have occupied. So the personalities of the demons will all be different depending on uh, their particular course of development. You know, if they go from person to person, they will acquire the memories of no and knowledge of that person and carry it along with them, and personality, for good or ill, uh, to the next person. Uh, now, the temple, uh, the, uh, the bastard's order in the world of five gods devotes itself to trying to control these creatures, because they are chaos creatures, and they will create disorder. Uh, not regulated. Everything from disorder in the body to, that they occupy to disorder in the world around them. Uh, and there, there are ways to control and use that disorder, but you have to kind of know what you're doing, so you need the temple training. Uh, so they devote themselves to, you know, first of all, catching the demons if they're still in animal form, or if they have acquired a human, uh, you know, getting the human uh, back. Uh, Sometimes the demon has to be like forcibly objected, uh, uh, ejected from the human by a by a saint of the bastard. Um, uh, sometimes the human can train up as a temple sorcerer and you know, learn how to manage their demon properly, and sort of join the uh, join the organization, which is kind of Penrick's route. There, he wasn't expecting to be a temple sorcerer. Um, so there's there's all kinds of ways to do it there in, the, in this world. But it gives me, as a writer, you know, a great deal of ability to make varied demons. They're not all alike. They're not all of a kind. Uh, they will they will each contain their their histories, uh, and so that's a lot of fun. Yeah. So they have a they sort of have the impression of all the the various personalities they've passed through, mm -hmm. um, an amalgam of sorts of. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, it depends on how long it's been going on, you know, if it's just the first personality, then that's all they've got, you know, if they've got two or three, then they've got to, you know, kind of make them work together, or not. Um, Penrick's demon has been in 12 creatures, beings. Uh, the first two were a, li um, a mare and then a lioness who killed and ate the mare and acquired the demon, and then when the lioness died, it went to a, a mountain woman in uh, Sidonia. And from there, it, you know, it chained up among humans. Uh, the the idea for the demon is to always jump to the the strongest, best bet next person in the vicinity when their when their current mount you know dies out from under them, uh, yeah. is killed or or whatever. Um, so it also makes demons desired by people who know this but really don't quite know the downsides of having a demon. Um, you know if if you catch a sorcerer or a sorceress and kill them, you can force the demon to jump to you, and then you'll have the power. Uh, but this, of course, also comes with personality or personalities and a whole bunch of other things going on. So it's, like, it's a bad idea to do this, but it, you know, it's the kind of thing people do. Yeah. The, um, the demons can become ascendant over their hosts, but yes. they're not generally... Well, it's one of the many hazards of, of having a demon. You know, the demon can take over. You know. Usually, if the demon is an animal, is in an animal, uh, it will be ascended because the animal doesn't have enough you know, mental powers to overpower it. 
if it jumps to a human, it will depend on the personality of the person and knowledge of the person. Yeah. Uh, the right kind of person can master a demon and, and have it be you know, become part of, you know, part of this array of power. And if not, the demon can just jump on the body and go have a party until the body wears out. And the demon doesn't care because, uh, you know, because they can always jump to another. So getting, getting a demon tamed down and being cooperative is, is another of the temple's long-term goals. You know, so temple demons who have been uh, passed from divine to divine and, and trained for a while uh, become very valuable. The most valuable demons are ones who have been tamed and trained enough to become uh, to enter a physician and allow the physician to do medical magic. That's the trickiest and probably the most interesting form of magic that demons can do. So along comes this uh, 18-year-old, 19-year-old guy, Penrick Gerald, um, walking down the road and... Uh, He's actually going to meet his uh, potential fiance. <laughs> Correct. Yep. He's supposed, he's supposed to be on his way to his betrothal ceremony. Yeah. And there's this uh, there's this old divine. Uh, I don't know if she's old or not, but she's sick. Um, she's Rush, yeah, fairly Ru elderly. Uh. Uh, her name is Rushia, and she's and and it changes Penrick's course of life forever. Yeah, basically you find this out in like the first few pages of the first novella, so I don't think we're doing too many spoilers no, here. No, no. But she is a, a trained divine of the bastard. She's had this demon for many years. Uh, she's had a, an interesting life that's only been hinted at uh, working for the temple. Um, and uh, But, you know, life catches up with her, and she, she basically has a heart attack while riding down the road to you know, get back to her, uh, her home uh, her home base, and uh, Pedrick, being a good kid, you know, stops and tries to help. So he's the one that's standing there when she dies, and her demon has to jump. But uh, interestingly, the demon, or Ruchia probably, uh, requests Pedrick's assent. Do you assent to this? And he says, sure, what? <laughs> and then he's got a demon. <laughs> Surprise! Uh, so that, was, that scene was a lot of fun as he... As he agrees, yeah, agrees agreeably to something that he doesn't really understand the implications of, and then proceeds to learn, spend the rest of the novella learning what this all means. Well, tell Along us the reader. Tell us about. Uh, I mean, Penrick is himself just this. Uh, it's really interesting character that he's got because he is. Uh, he's he's kind of a plain spoken, truth telling kind of guy who calls it like he sees it. Um, at the same time, he's, he's clever. He's not stupid. Um, mm -hmm. and he's, he's very winning. Uh, he's, he's a lot of fun to just hang out with. Um, mm -hmm. and he's a little bit funny as well. D tell us a little bit about his character. And I, yeah, the character of the viewpoint character is really important for setting the tone of a book. You know, if a character has no sense of humor, you know, it's really hard to put humor in, you know, in a way that the reader will get it. If the character's got witty and interesting thoughts, then the reader can be privy to that. Uh, the, I think the proper liter literary term for it is interiority, meaning you know, you're inside a character's head that's an interesting or agreeable place to be. And Kenrick, Penrick's, the inside of Penrick's head is pretty agreeable. He's got a sense of humor. He's very smart. He's much smarter than he knows he is. Uh, and then when he acquires... Desdemona and her, all her previous lives and all their languages. Yeah, he gets this this turbo boost on you know, education too. Of the previous uh, uh, sorceresses were physicians, so he gets he gets like a medical education along with you know the six languages and so on. I mean, he wanted to go to university and his family couldn't afford it. Yeah, you know? so all of a sudden he gets it. So that was fun. Uh, so yeah, but he has to work out his his internal arrangement with this. Parasite being, well, not parasite, more of a symbiote. Could be a parasite, but in this case, a symbiotic relationship with this intangible being that is full of opinions herself. Um, so 
so yeah, Penrick, Penrick is fun fun to be in. Uh-huh. Yeah. The other thing I wanted with Penrick uh, particularly is to not be a soldier. I've done a lot of soldier and military stuff. You know, uh, guys fighting, uh, and, and I wanted a character who wanted like nothing to do with any of that. Uh, Henrik's older brother, Drovo, had gone off to be a mercenary, essentially a Swiss mercenary in this world, and come to a quick and bad end uh, on that line of work, you know, which discouraged the family from trying to get Henrik to do likewise. He's just like, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Well, tell us tell us a little bit about this family, because, I mean, it's important in all of the Henrik stories that Henrik has had a, even though he's a nobleman, he's, He's kind of from the country, and he's he's mm-hmm. experienced a lot of stuff. He, I mean, he's he knows how to um, shoot arrows and yeah. hunt and stuff well, like he had, that. He had actually a rather idyllic childhood. He was raised as effectively the son of a country squire. Uh, Baron Kingerald is you know, a little more than a squire, but yeah. But basically, he's he's the uh, the baron of a, a rather limited mountain valley. But, you know, and that was Penrick's whole world growing up, and his dad was kind of in charge of it. Uh, so Penrick got to run around in the mountains and the fields and the farms. You know, he turned out for the haying, as everyone would. You know, he went hunting in the mountains with the, the crews who went out to, like, gather food, and, you know, shoot sheep and whatnot. Uh, so he had, uh, he had a very rural upbringing. He had training at the local town's temple, um, and, you know, he got as much as he could, but it was, you know, it was a small town. There wasn't, you know, by the time he'd read every book on the bookshelf, which he could do in a very short time, there wasn't anything else to read. <laughs> um, and it was mostly theology. Yeah. So, uh, so there was that. You know, so he was not an intellectual youth, mostly through lack of access. You know, he just didn't, you know, it didn't exist in his world. And there were just a few books of tales, and then the rest was other stuff which he read, you know, he read much the way you read back of cereal boxes because it's the only thing that's there. Um, so, smart kid. But he learned, you know, physical skills, a lot of physical skills in his teens, you know, how to ride, how to shoot arrows, you know, how to, uh, you know, camp in the mountains and survive outside and how farms work. Uh, so all this kind of thing is, is like uh, like important important stuff to know in a in a less technological world. Yeah. So he had that before he got onto uh, onto his uh, later life and more intellectual pursuits. Yeah, I mean he be, he will become a scholar and and such. But the uh, the other interesting thing about Desdemona and Penric is that Desdemona is is made up of twelve women. So he's <laughs> basically got this council of. <laughs> Of women in his head, that, yeah, that are it's like a council of ten older sisters. It's really appalling sometimes, from his point of view. Kind of twelve counting the lioness and the mayor. We always never quite know how to uh, yeah. categorize them. But he's a guy, and, you know, and yeah, yeah. So all of a sudden, he's got all this insight into women that he wasn't expecting to have at age nineteen, which is also very unusual for a nineteen-year-old guy. Uh, but they're like, you know, they're like team of Bertie Wooster's magical medieval ants, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, but they're, they're riding along in his head, so it's uncomfortable sometimes, but, uh, but he works it out, you know, with yeah. the crew. Well, one of the things that um, is so great about Penrick is that he, he really likes Desdemona and is willing to do mm-hmm. things for her, this demon uh, amalgam. Um, and nobody has done that for her, it seems. Yeah. She's constantly surprised when he wants to. Treated more in a more utilitarian fashion originally. Her first several writers you know, had had no contact with the temple. The first three were Sidonian women, and then uh, a couple more she arrived. Uh, interestingly, uh, became the demon of a uh, basically a, a high-class courtesan in, in Modi, which is kind of the Venice of my world. Uh, and then had a couple, another life and adventure, and then finally arrived uh, in Bergard. Was at the last uh, her writer was picked up by the temple, and she started getting temple training. So her next writer was a uh, a very serious temple divine uh, priestess, 
and uh, then the next two were physicians, uh, very high-grade physicians. So Desdemona has been sort of leveling up you know, throughout her 10 lives uh, in terms of uh, what she knows and what she can do. Uh, and then her most recent writer, Ruccio, was sort of a, a temple agent, you know, uh, maybe a spy sometimes, you know, sometimes diplomatic agent, sometimes other things, sometimes sorcerers. So she had to... She had a more varied life. So Desdemona has a huge store of, of experience uh, through all these women's lives. Now it is, when you are a temple demon, uh, you know, the tradition is, although the, obviously not the requirement, is that you're handed on to a person of the same sex each time your writer, or each time your person dies. Um, but, uh, but obviously that doesn't always happen. I had some fun with gender issues with that. Yeah, it's it's cool. And the stories then, um, what becomes interesting is that I mean, these are kind of mysteries. I mean, that's really what they're like little, uh, they're not cozies, but they're something akin to that in a way. Um, there's, there's a mystery element to each of these novellas. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, mystery and fantasy is interesting. You not only have the central problem mystery, whatever is within the context of the world, you also have the mystery of, of the world. You know, uh, Part of what a story should do is show you this world and how it is different from ours in the course of the story. So you, you're learning the world as well as learning the mystery. And of course there are mysteries of character. Um, you learn about other characters, you learn about you know, your viewpoint characters. Uh, each story has an opportunity to bring up more um, more knowledge uh, and uh, widen, you know, widen the view. Well, so that's a fun thing you can do. Yeah. Well, maybe let's uh, briefly talk about some of the bad guys in, in the first one, the Klee brothers. Uh, I don't. I know we don't want to really get into what happens and everything, but what what is the danger there? Ah, um, oh, the danger is Penrick, particularly young innocent Penrick. This is kind of how he learns better. Um, it's a temptation to people. Uh, oh, he has a demon, we can steal it from him. We'll have to murder him to do it, but yeah, that's okay. Um, you know, the kind of person who would, who would want that. Um, so, so, uh, so he learns, yeah, he learns that power comes with envy. If you have power, people envy and desire it. Um, uh, so it taught him, teaches him something about the world. It's also fun because he, um, he 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 seems a little bit of a naive at first, but then we we come to see that he's smarter than the <laughs> than he appears. <laughs> well, that's a real high bar to get over, but yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, he's he's naive, but he's not stupid. You know, he learns fast, um, and once he is in full communication with Desdemona, he has basically access to 10 prior lives going back 200 years and all kinds of experiences that you know, can illuminate you know, what he does and what he chooses. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so it's... So they, but they, the Klee brothers who are trying to get Desdemona from him perhaps have bitten off more they can chew, but when, you can find out by reading it. Yeah. Um, they have, you know, all they see is the power. If you have a sorcerer, you have magic powers, and you could like dominate other people. And they just don't know about the hazards and the peculiarities and the, and the uh, pitfalls uh, of uh, of having a demon. Yeah. And Penrick is set up. Um, the next novella is, is several years later. Um, hmm. Pen, Penrick set up. He he gets sent to university by um, the princess. Uh, Lewin of, of Wales, I guess. Uh, yeah, Princess Lewin, she's actually the Princess Archdivine of uh, Martinsbridge, uh, which is the town where he, where Ruccio was heading and where Penrick ended up. And uh, Penrick ends up working for her uh, as her court sorcerer eventually. But he has to go to university first and learn how to be a proper divine because you're, you're supposed to be a divine if you have a temple demon. Uh, supposed to be trained as a priest. Uh, I spent actually a lot of time researching. I was thinking I will go off and do a magic school story, except it will be a magic university, and Pendick will learn all this stuff. And 
and I ended up skipping over it. Um, you know, I had to think about it a lot. I researched some really interesting research reading about medieval universities, which kind of illuminated where a lot of things about modern universities come from, which I, I think they're more conscious of in Europe, where the same university has been existed for a thousand years, that here, when we're you know, down the road from state university that's you know, only maybe a few decades old. But, uh, but that was really interesting that I somehow didn't end up wanting to write a school story uh, as much as Henrik wanted to go to school. <laughs> For one thing, one, two, four of his prior writers, two, three, four, had already been through university <laughs> and medical school in two cases. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, so he, he went through the course unusually quickly uh, and, and acquired his, uh, his status as a as a divine of the bastard's order. Yeah. And so when next we meet him in Penrick and the Shaman... Uh, yeah, he's... Next, which is the next book in this novella collection, or next story in this three novella collection, by the way. So. Yeah. He's uh, he's called uh, by Lewin to um, talk to this guy named Senior Locator Oswell, who becomes a continuing character in uh, in some of the Penrick stories. He surprised me by coming up in the in the third story, Penrick's Fox, but in this story he's just introduced... And he is a rather beleaguered, uh, kind of a, a detective inspector character uh, or policeman, uh, but he works for the Father's Order. Now, the Father is the god of justice, among other things. And he has been sent in pursuit of a shaman who is accused of murder. And uh, you know, he's going after a magical dude. Uh, he needs to get a magician on his side if he's going to take this shaman on, because shamans have, uh, also have magical powers differently, uh, differently acquired than, than the ones that sorcerers do. Uh, so, uh, so he stops more or less on the way, uh, chasing after his fugitive uh, at Martin's Bridge, where Penrick is, is working for the Princess Archdivine, uh, actually working on uh, translating Ruccia's book about Sorcery and sorcery and medicine that uh, that she had written. Uh, he's translating into one of the several languages he has acquired. Anyway, this gets interrupted, and he is assigned to Oswell, and they have to go off into the mountains uh, to chase the runaway shaman, and uh, oh, thereby hangs a tale. Uh, well, how does tell us how shamanism or shamanism works? Shaman, shaman. I'm not the, even sure how it's pronounced. I don't know. Probably a proper way. Uh, it's actually a Russian word, it turns out, or at least Siberian by origin. It has nothing to do. So the, the plural of shaman is not shaman. <laughs> shamans. But uh, regularly side note there. Um, for shamans in this world, in the world of the five gods, uh, shamans are more or less created by humans. This is an old tradition of the Weald, which is another country, uh, uh, different from Chalian or, you know, uh, Penrick's birthplace of Cantons, uh, that, you know, in, back in the days of the old forest tribes, uh, they worked out how to sacrifice one animal into another, transfer its soul, and once again sort of level up. Um, first you could transfer the spirit of a fierce animal into a person and make them a spirit warrior, you know, kind of a berserker, uh, extra-powered uh, soldier. Well, not soldier, warrior. It wasn't really a soldier sort of place there. Um, or if you uh, sacrificed animal into animal over many generations, you got a great beast, which when sacrificed into a human made the human a shaman. And not just a warrior. And this shaman could then go on to do magical stuff, including make more spirit warriors and make more great beasts. So this is this is really explain this a little more because this is really cool. All right, so it's like laying down tracks on a rock album or you know, (laughs) something like that, right? Um it gets thicker sort of the degree of the animal. Yeah. And become more complex and more powerful and at some point they sort of sort of tip over, there's a tipping point at which they become, you know, this magical thing that can be acquired and used to do certain kinds of magical acts. Um, They're not quite identical to uh, 
to the way uh, uh, sorcerer's magic with chaos demons works. It's, it's kind of related and kind of not. But uh, what is interesting from it, the chaos demon, eventually it comes from the god. You know, eventually it's, it's some piece of the white god or the white god, you know, chaos that he rules over. But the uh, the shamans, the great beasts that make them shamans, are completely a human thing. You know, one human, you know, a human creation, as it were. Um, and it is a creation that has to be created over generational time because you know, it takes time to you know, uh, breed these animals up and you know, sacrifice one into another and, and so on. So it's it's a very long term project to get this kind of power. You know, there's there's no insta power here to be had uh, particularly. So there's a, there's a whole culture that grew up surrounding that. Now, in The Hallowed Hunt, this has gone into in, in more detail in that novel, uh, which is set in the Weald, um, we learn in their history that, you know, the forest tribes had these spirit warriors, they had these uh, shaman, and uh, they were at war with Darthika, which is you know, next-door neighbor, uh, and were eventually conquered, and the forest tribes and their magic were pretty much wiped out by the Barthicans, who were Quintarians, uh, this is, you know, the five gods religion, uh, because they were, you know, they were really dangerous. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was one of those, you know, wars that took place you know, over, over generations, like the, like the, uh, the Germans and the Romans. But, uh, so for a while there, the, uh, the shamanic la- magic was kind of went underground and was lost, uh, and only lately revived. So that was there's a whole like history cycle that goes with that that development, um, which is not part of Patrick <laughs> Stevens' first story. It's just the backstory. Yeah, but the um, so the okay. shamans in these novellas are they're kind of uh, reacquiring this old knowledge through. Yeah, it's uh, part partly as a consequence of the events of the Hallowed Hunt. Uh, shamanic magic comes back into limited acceptability um, and uh, so the the shaman who is who's the runaway shaman who's accused of murder is actually an official uh, royal shaman of you know belonging to uh, or subordinate to the uh, the king of the wield um, so uh, so that's yeah that's the thing the magic is power and power you know, is either conscripted or you know extirpated you can't let it just wander around doing things randomly uh, well tell us a little bit about this shaman Inglis uh, Ken Wolfcliff so the shamans have each one of them has a particular kind of animal that they're yeah, so you, one animal is sort of all into this animal of the same kind the same kind of sex traditionally so you would sacrifice dogs into dogs or you know, lynxes into lynxes yeah. um, generally favors, you know, powerful predators, because that goes back to the warrior tradition. I mean, nobody wants to be the inheritor of a great chicken, particularly. Um, <laughs> what would you get? A really stupid animal. Um, so, Aimless's traditional and family creature was wolf. Um, uh, so, he, has a, he, has, he is the possessor of a great wolf, fairly recently. He's a young shaman. And so that gives him his powers and gives him his uh, his abilities, and it gives his abilities a certain twist. Uh, if you had a if you had a different animal, you'd have a slightly different flavor of power. But, but they all kind of converge uh, to the same kind of abilities to do things. Uh, there was a character in the Hallowed Hunt who was uh, by the name of Horse River, who you know, his family totem animal was horses. So. Another powerful animal that got uh, got turned into great beasts and then eventually made shamans. And we meet a uh, a dog shaman, our shaman in this uh, story as well. Yeah, Skula. Uh, so, yeah, we find out you know more about what's been going on out in the boonies, out of sight of the officialdom. You know? uh, so that's a lot of fun. So I got to explore a bit of the world. I got to explore world building. Um, I got to explore these three characters. The other thing I did with this as a novella was make it multi-viewpoint. 
the first novella had been all, all Penrick's viewpoint. And this one I played around with breaking up the viewpoint, which you could just barely do in a novella. You know, it's, uh, uh, short stories are really too short to be multiple viewpoint. Uh, you get into a viewpoint, you kind of ride along with it for a while. You don't want to get, get ejected from it prematurely. As a reader, that's kind of uncomfortable. Uh, there, there are stories that hinge on that and use that you know, as part of their shtick. But in general, multiple viewpoint works better with longer stories. I got to do multiple viewpoint with, with that story. And that allowed me, also allowed me to see Penrick from the outside, which is a lot of fun. Uh, because, uh, because it's a very different view than Penrick from the inside. Yeah, well, we see how the uh, the what do you call him? The gray gray uh, the cop um, uh, Oswell. Gray Gray Jay is what they're dubbed. Yeah. Gray, how he um, at first he he just thinks Penrith's kind of crazy, but he comes uh, yeah. to comes to respect him, and we see it from the respect grow in you know from his viewpoint, which is kind of cool. Yeah, the other thing I got to explore the first story you know I explored Penrith becoming a sorcerer, you know, learning about the magic. The second story really concentrates, ends up concentrating, not so much on his sorcery, but on his other hat as a as a divine, as a priest. You know, he has priestly duties that he's sworn to, and you know, these, these are called upon in the course of the story. He thought he would be going off with his bow and arrow to have an exciting hunt, but he was actually called upon to do, like, spiritual advising. Wait a minute, I'm only, like, 24. <laughs> uh, but what are, what is the, what's the story? Uh, so Oswell has, is charged with um, finding the shaman um, who he thinks has killed this other shaman um, and, uh, and maybe carrying his spirit. Yeah, that was that was the other thing. Yeah, he's not only accused of murder. Uh, Oswell is of the opinion, although nobody else back at Oswell's headquarters agreed with him, uh, that uh, that uh, that Inglis, the shaman, had made away with his victim's soul, his spirit, because it, uh, once again, this goes back to the hallowed hunt. Uh, it is uh, it is established that one one of the things that happened with the spirit warriors on the battlefield was that when they died, their spirits and their creatures needed to be separated from each other by a shaman before the human could go on to the gods to the afterlife. Uh, otherwise, they'd be stuck in the world and you know, dwindled as a ghost. Uh, so there was a technique developed for you know, capturing the souls of the slain spirit warriors and taking them back to a place where you know, where they could be sort of treated, <laughs> treated and released. Uh, and this uh, this turns up as as a plot point here, as this, this method uh, and uh, how it can go wrong and how it can go very wrong without giving away the whole plot there. But yeah, so uh, so all of these kinds of magics uh, played in. So that got me. Story gave me a chance to see, to compare and contrast sorcery and shamanism. Uh, and, uh, well, it's interesting the way you make the rules of the magic play, and it you it, it suggests a mystery to you. Um, uh huh. Well, you know, you got to give the character something to do. You know, Hendrick, left to his own devices, would just sit happily happily in his study <laughs> and translate stuff, <laughs> yeah. um, which. It's entertaining for him, but maybe not so much for the reader. Well, he has to be booted out and made to you know, solve problems. Yeah, it's it's a I'm cool not little. Do stories, Go ahead. Sorry, with Penrick, I'm just not. Um, there are, there are reasons that this kind of magic is not used for killing. Mm. Um, then uh, then he has to have he has to have problems. Yeah, yeah. either it has to be an internal problem, something generated from his situation that you know, he wants to fix. Or it has to be a problem that comes in to him from the outside and either drops on him by chance, the way you know, in the first story he ran across Ruccia by chance, uh, or it can be assigned to him. Now, the wonderful thing about having a character who is a member of a you know, some organization is that they can be assigned problems. Uh, you know, they, uh, in this case, he was assigned uh, the problem of the runaway shaman by his Princess Archdivine, by his uh, superior yeah. in the order. 
And that kind of that also comes into play in the third story, Frederick Spock, which we can get to in a moment here. Yeah, but there's, I mean, it's 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 also true that in the original novella, which is, um, I mean, it devolves in, I mean, it doesn't devolve, but it, it evolves into a bit of a courtroom standoff between the Clee brothers and Penrick. Um, mm-hmm. And it all turns on how the magic works. And uh, it's and a mystery. Speaking that, the truth. Yeah. yeah. And how do you know? Yeah. So, well, uh, this, this sort of triad of um, Oswell, who is a, it's very empirical um, down to earth guy, calls him like he sees him, Penrick and Inglis, um, mm-hmm. who we might say does survive. <laughs> <laughs> Penrick and the Shaman. They show up in Penrick's Fox, the uh, third novella, uh-huh. um, where we get yeah. more kind of cool how the sorcery works, um, yeah, determines in the this story. Case, it's, it's again a mystery. Uh, and once again, the mystery allows me to explore the world and its magic, you know, not just the you know, whodunit, which is sort of almost the least part of it. But in this case, the victim is a sorceress. Uh, you know, the body is found. So, you know, first of all, there's murder. She's clearly been murdered. Uh, Inglis is pursuing this case because it's happening in his territory, and he's assigned to it. Uh, and secondly, okay, she was a sorceress. She had a demon. Where is the demon? It had to have jumped when she died, but it's nowhere to be found on the crime scene. So that becomes Henrik's part of the story. Inglis is chasing down the, the physical murderer, you know, the person who shot this woman in the back. And Penrick is chasing down what happened to this trained temple demon, which is a very valuable creature and you know shouldn't be out you know, wandering around in the world uh, unsupervised. And so uh, so we have kind of a dual mystery, mostly concentrating on Penrick uh, yeah. and following that out to the end without giving but away too many spoilers. It's really hard to kill. I mean, this is kind of a locked room mystery because you can't, really kill a sorcerer I mean, in a it's really hard to kill a sorcerer um, it's hard to kill a sorcerer who sees you coming <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah there are ways there are a lot of ways but uh, but you know just trying to knife them wouldn't work you know, they have ways of evading or dealing with you that uh, that simply another swordsman wouldn't have um, so, uh, so she's shot with an arrow. So yeah. somebody had to stand off to do it, right? Is that the distance? Yeah. So why that distance? Why that method? Uh, where's the demon? Why was she shot? You know, uh, were they trying to steal her demon? Or were they trying to do something else? Uh, so you know, if the demon was stolen by a nefarious person, well, now we have a powerful temple demon in the hands of somebody who really shouldn't have one. Um, so yeah, many were the possibilities. Uh, so I had a lot of fun uh, working out one of them, uh, which Penrick eventually eventually solved. So those those were two mysteries, and it probably made people think I was writing a mystery series. But part of the point of these novellas is their open endedness. I can jump anywhere in Penrick's timeline. I can you know do multiple viewpoint, I can do simple viewpoint, I can do different kinds of stories. I'm not limited to one kind of thing or one set of characters. So this is kind of a deliberate setup on my part to see just how much flexibility you can get into a into a series. You know, not be in some kind of series straight jacket where stories have to march out one by one as if linked on a chain. Yeah. And one of the interesting things is how is Desdemona's not scared of much, but she is scared of um this dude Broilin of Idao. Um mm-hmm. what is what is it that um what's so bad about Idao? The one place she doesn't want to go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, this brings up what what can kill demons if every time, you know, they're their rider, their person is killed. They just don't jump to another. You know, they, there's nothing that takes them out. Well, it turns out the gods can. Uh, so the demons are scared of the gods because the gods are the one thing that can kill them. And uh, one of the things that is developed in the novel Paladin of Souls from way back when is just how this happens. Uh, basically, a saint of the white god, a saint of the bastard, uh, 
is granted by the by the god the ability to basically eat demons to suck them up out of the world and hand them back you know, into the bastard's hell where they are you know, boiled down for parts basically because <laughs> it's a, a place of chaos where no no order can be sustained and so yeah for that for the demon that is destruction um, big handed back to the god is the one way a demon can die and uh, all their knowledge and everything they know would go with them you know, there's no afterlife for demons as such in this world. Um, so, yeah, so demons are, are terrified of saints who are channels to the god uh, and any other method that, you know, could hand them back to the god and, and uh, basically kill them. Um, and they're not scared of much else. <laughs> but uh, if, like Desdemona, they have become emotionally invested in their person, you know, they might be scared for their person, you know, person to survive so they can go on being their person as long yeah. as possible um one other thing i wanted to uh, to bring up which i thought was delightful was the beginning of penrick's fox um penrick and inglis are sitting there and penrick is trying to make a great worm um mm -hmm. with a bunch of earthworms can He's... Only less so. yeah penrick has <laughs> got very interested in shamanism as a result of meeting Inglis and, and wants to learn how to do it. You know, he's convinced that shamanism and sorcery must be connected on some level. Uh, so he's a he's a temple sorcerer geek, really. Uh, and Inglis is a shaman geek. You know, so they're both there sort of geeking together, you know, having one of these you know, uh, sophomore college late night intellectual arguments, except that it's uh, you know, they're on an afternoon out fishing, but, uh, uh, you know, about which which came first, you know, the shaman or the sorcerer, how does it work, you know, can shaman, can sorcerers do shamanism, well, Penrix demonstrates, yeah, you can, you can make a worm, yeah, but, but, English is, but you can't make it blast, which is shortly proved, but the worm can be recycled as bait, so it isn't a dead loss. Um so that was, that was fun to kind of do them, uh, do them both geeking out about their respective, uh, uh, sciences, as it were. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of hoping that there could be a, sh a worm shaman, but I guess that didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Who would want it? You know, what powers would it bring you? <laughs> you could eat dirt. <laughs> um, I suppose. I, but anyway, yeah. so uh, what else can we? What, what else should we say about the uh, the, the series of novellas that um, I? I don't know what else we could say that would about the stories that wouldn't give away too much. Yeah, well, we've kind of already I uh, hit a lot of spoilers here, but uh, but basically it is it is uh, uh, three novellas. It is not it is not a single novel. Um, uh, they have all been previously published as ebooks and as uh, limited hardcovers. So you know, if you have encountered them before in that form. This is then again. It's not a new thing. There's, you know, it's the usual problem whenever you put out a collection. Some people don't read the fine print and buy it thinking it's something new, and then they're like artificially disappointed. You know, this this is the, the stuff that you've been asking for on paper. Now it's on paper. Here you go. Um, so that's that's important for readers to know and understand going in. Uh, what else can I say about them? Well, it's all the. I mean, there is a progression of Penrick's uh, yeah, well, growth, and it it is sort of a. a it, I mean, they're interconnected, and um, Penrick does grow as a character throughout them. So you, I, they're in chronological. They are set in chronological order, although they were not written in chronological order. Really, that's interesting. Because I wrote yeah. Penrick's Fox after I wrote Penrick's Mission, which is part of the. It's the opening novella of the second collection, uh, uh -huh. titled Penrick's Travels. So and that's the one that's coming out in May. So yeah, so that's you know from the writer's point of view that creative flexibility to be able to jump around in the character's timeline uh, without having it be you know prematurely locked in to one form uh, is a lot of fun. Do you have a uh, a story where because I haven't read actually Penrich's Travels yet um, ah. where. Uh, I'm I'm greatly looking forward to it. Um, where a shaman, a, a great beast, and a demon are in the same <laughs> in the same room <laughs> person. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh oh oh! Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, no, a demon and a great beast cannot occupy the same person. It's a 
the question of there isn't room for votes. Yeah, so sadly, uh, you can't have anybody double up that way. And no, sh- no worm shamans, I guess. <laughs> so. Yeah, that was uh, that was a concern of, I guess, England or uh, a concern of um, well, both Penrick and uh, and Oswell in the second story. You know, if we catch the shaman, you know, is he going to try to take my demon? If we kill him, it's his great beast going to jump to me. Uh, and Desdemona says, no, it doesn't work like that. Desdemona is very handy because she's kind of a walking encyclopedia of odd information. She doesn't know everything, but you know, she knows a lot of stuff, and she can quietly cue pen in, you know, oh, no, I'm do that or the other thing, without having to spend a whole lot of time on exposition or setup or presenting the information in some uh, less succinct fashion. So, uh, so that's handy as a, as a novella thing, because we're trying to keep these stories compact. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a delightful series of novellas. It's kind of, I mean, it's not necessarily comic. Uh, it's not Jeeves, but um, there is that sort of lilting quality to the uh, to the narrative. I don't know. Um, both, both Penrick and Desdemona have senses of humor you know, to allow them to process the world you know, um, yeah. with that element in it. Uh, I've written characters who don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> And it gives you a different worldview, a different feel. I dubbed it, because I dubbed it, I called it the writer's headspace. There's a certain kind of headspace that you're in with with a viewpoint character. Um, And uh, they aren't all the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, Penrick is, Penrick is delightful to hang out with, and so is Desdemona. And the book is Penrick's Progress by Lois McMaster Bujol. Lois, thank you so much for uh, talking with us about, uh, about this uh, excellent new old book. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And the devoted gazes of a gaggle of peculiar children with superpowers and shiny yellow hair created by a maternity ward in Minneapolis accidentally built in the shape of a Klein's bottle. Plus, thanks, praise, and gratitude to Lois McMaster Bujol, author of Penrich's Progress. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars.